Hello and welcome to this virtual session. We're glad you can join us today. Before we get started, there's a few housekeeping items we'd like to go over with you now. Firstly, you can resize the webinar windows to cater to your viewing preferences. You can maximize, minimize and drag the windows to your preferred viewing size. If you look at the bottom middle of your screen, you can click on the widgets that you'll need to get the most out of this virtual experience. Secondly, Microsoft specialists are on hand to answer your questions in real time. So feel free to type in your questions using the Q&A window and we'll answer them as soon as we can. Lastly, we've provided some additional resources for you to supplement your learning. You can access them by clicking on the links in this section. Without further ado, I'll hand over to our speakers. Hi there and welcome back. I'm Josh Rodriguez, Microsoft Technical Trainer. And today, we're going to talk about Azure Storage. As we go through the outline, you're going to see that we're going to talk about storage services, redundancy options, how to use file migration, and all these kinds of things. But let's move on to storage accounts. Now, an Azure Storage account contains all of your Azure Storage data objects, including blobs, file shares, queues, tables, and disks. Now, the storage account provides a unique namespace for your Azure storage data that's accessible from anywhere in the world. Now, it's accessible over HTTP or HTTPS. And data in your storage account is durable. And it's highly available, secure, and massively, massively scalable. But there is one thing you should know about storage accounts. Actually, a couple. <laughs> they must must, must have a globally unique name. Now, storage account names must be between 3 and 24 characters in length, and they may only contain numbers and lower case letters. Now, another thing is, your storage account name must be also unique within Azure. So no two storage accounts can have the same name. So now that we know about storage accounts, let's talk redundancy. Your storage is incredibly important, and you need to make sure it's highly available and protected. So let's talk about some redundancy options. Now earlier, we talked about building an additional availability. But when it comes to storage accounts, while they work a little bit similar, they also work a little bit different. And essentially, every single time that you create a storage account and you upload data into it, Azure is then making three copies of it. And the way that those three copies are going to be stored and organized 
is depending on what redundancy option that you select. So, for example, if we start with a locally redundant storage, also known as LRS, here, as you can see, you have three copies of your data in a single data center in a single region. But let's say you want to move up and improve that. Well, then we can go ahead and go with zone redundant storage, or ZRS. Now, this allows us to create three availability zones in the primary region. And if we remember, an availability zone is a copy of our data across three separate data centers within the same region. Now, how about we take it up a notch and we try to get to those 16 nines and go to Geo Zone Redundant Storage. Now, this allows us to have our data in a single data center in both the primary and the secondary regions. And then finally, we go to the top of the line, GZ. RS, or Geo Zone Redundant Storage. Now this also has 16 nines in durability. But this redundancy has three availability zones in the primary region and a single data center in the secondary region. Now as you increase your redundancy, yes, you are also going to increase your costs. But again, for business critical items, this allows you to increase your overall availability. Now from a pass approach, we have what's called container storage. Let's pause for a second here, okay? Container storage has absolutely nothing to do with container compute services, okay? I want to make that very clear so we don't get confused. Container storage more commonly referred to as blob storage, this is what we're using for our unstructured data. And data is actually structured in three different formats. So first, you have structured data, then you have semi-structured data, and last, you have unstructured data. Now, unstructured data is any type of data that doesn't have any kind of schema enforcing it, right? And the schema, think of it like, like an inventory table, right? Like a physical version of Excel where you have strict columns and rows. Now that's an example of structured data. Semi-structured data, that might be something similar to a JSON file, like templates that you're going to look at when you create resources. There's some format to it, but it's also gonna vary slightly depending on which file you're looking at, right? It isn't as structured as the strict columns and rows of structured data. And then, unstructured data. Well, that's data that's just completely different from file to file. Usually, unstructured data can be classified as photos, uh, images, uh, audio files, binary files, text files, PDFs. These are all examples of container storage or blob storage, which is an acronym for binary large object. And with blob storage, okay, or blob container storage, this is something that we see used every single day. This is used frequently for hosting images on a public website. Because you can upload your own image and host it to your website, and you can choose whether or not it can be accessed from the public internet. And this is going to be a pass offering. So you're just leveraging. You're just concerned about your files that you're uploading you're not necessarily managing the actual server that's hosting it. And from an infrastructure as a service side, we have two different options. The first one is going to be disk storage, which is what we created with our virtual machine. Disk storage provides disks for Azure virtual machines. Applications and other services can access and use these disks as needed, similar to how they would be in on-premises scenarios. Disk storage allows data to be persistently stored and accessed from an attached virtual hard disk. And there are various sizes of you know, hard drive disks or HDDs and solid state drives or SSDs. Now, if we think about the virtual machine that we created, right? The Azure virtual machine with, you know, we used separate disks, right? To store different data. 
So sometimes you may see a data disk and an OS disk with it, for example. And then finally, we have Azure Files. Now, Azure Files is very, very similar to the file share that you would have in your on-premises environment. Azure Files offers fully managed file shares in the cloud that are accessible via the industry standard server message block protocol, SMB, or network file system protocol, NFS. Azure file shares can be used to replace or even supplement on-premises file servers. And another use with it is to be for lift and shift applications because using file share makes that process easy. So you're lifting and shifting applications to the cloud that expect a file share to store file application or even user data. Now, those are just a couple of different uses for it. And as we talk about storage, something else we have to consider in these storage services is something called access tiers. Now, here on the screen, you're going to see tons of different storage services and public endpoints. But your storage will also be in access tiers. And inside of Azure Storage, you have three different access tiers that you can choose from when storing your files. They're called Hot, Cool, and Archive. Now, by default, when I create a storage account that data has, is basically is placed in it, okay, it's going to the hot tier. The hot tier is going to have the lowest latency, whereas the archive tier is going to have the highest latency. So remember, hot access is data that we're using right now. This means things like images that we're hosting because we are actively using those images. Now, cool storage, cool storage is data that probably, you know, maybe once was hot, but now we're not using it as much because we're not quite ready to forget it and put it into archive. And, you know, we're just not ready to let go of it. So this is going to lower the latency, but where this is also a benefit is when it comes to cost because hot access has the highest cost associated. With it, whereas archive is going to have the lowest associated to it. So cool storage allows you to save some money by moving into something that maybe takes a little bit longer to load, but it allows you to save that money. Now, let's say, for example, you have to hold on to data for some type of retention policy or because you have to keep records of data for auditing or it's just something you want to store, right? Maybe it has personal value. You can move it into the archive access tier, which actually moves it offline. So this is something that we don't recommend that you use unless you don't need to use or access that data for at least 180 days. And remember, remember, because of the latency requirements and since it's stored offline, it can take a couple of hours or actually even longer to actually rehydrate that data and have it ready for use. So again, this is something that you're just simply hanging on to. You're not necessarily actively using it. It's a low cost with incredibly high latency. And in fact, in order to get your archive data, sometimes you have to switch it into a cool or access tier just to access it or use it. And then next, we're going to be doing a demonstration where we're going to create a blob storage. So in this demonstration, what we're going to do is we're going to create a storage account first. From there, we're going to create our container. And in our container, we're going to upload some images and test them out and see if we can access them from the public internet. So here we are in our Azure portal. And as you can see, just like we've done before, we can decide what we want to do, how we want to navigate. So again, we can always search right up top. We can create a resource. We can even click right over here, like we call it that hamburger menu, and look for storage accounts. But let's try to create it the resource way. So first, we're going to go ahead and click Create a Resource. So after Create a Resource, as you can see, we have our options here on the left side. Now, last time, we used Compute, which was a virtual machine. But this time, we want storage. So I'm going to go ahead and click the Storage. And as you can see, tons of options here when it comes to storage. But what we want to do is we want to create a very basic storage account. 
So I'm actually going to click on it from the top and see go to storage accounts. Now you're going to see I have a couple here. Well, I'm going to go ahead and hit create. So let's create our storage account. Now, what resource group are we putting it in? Well, we want to go ahead and put it in that resource group uh, AZ900. So in AZ900, we are now going to create our storage account. Now, remember those naming conventions when it comes to storage. They have to be unique. So if I were to name this storage storage, well, guess what? It's not going to work because it's not unique. Another thing is if I put it in all caps, so if I called it storage, uh, one, two, three, a bunch of numbers, it's still not going to work. Why is that? Because again, they have to be all lower cases. So remember those naming conventions. It's incredibly important to know that when you're creating your resource. So I'm going to go ahead and name this storage. Uh, we're going to name it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Hopefully that, oh, look at that. Even that is taken. So we're just going to call it storage. And guess what? I'm just going to type in a couple of random numbers. So look at that. That happened to work. So we're going to call it storage. We're going to have all those numbers right after it. Again, we have to select a region. So the region that it's going to be in is U.S. East, because remember, our regions can determine our cost. Now, I'm going to leave it in U.S. East for now, but again, I could put it wherever I want. Now, as far as performance, as you can see, I can determine whether I want to have premium performance for my block blobs, my file shares, or my page blobs in my storage account. But again, for the purpose of the demonstration, I'm going to leave it on standard. But now... Let's take a look at redundancies. And look at all the options we have. We have locally redundant storage, also known as LRS, geo redundant storage, also known as GRS, and zone redundant storage, ZRS, and geo zone redundant storage, known as GZRS. So we have four options here. Now it defaults to GRS, but again, for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to keep it local. So I'm going to put locally redundant storage. Now from here, I can go into advanced and check out a couple other things. So in advanced, I'm going to look at security, and how to configure essentially what I want when it comes to security. Now when it comes to networking, I'm looking at here what I want to do when it comes to networking, right? I can determine the access. I can determine the routing. I can even look at data protection. Now, in data protection, it's always about how I want my recovery. And one of the things I like is how you can have soft delete for your blobs, containers, and file shares. Now, in encryption, again, we can encrypt it how we want. And again, we can always tag it. So we always have the options of tags. But I'm going to go ahead and click review. And hopefully, we can pass that validation. And it looks like we're good to go. So we're going to go ahead and hit create. Hopefully, it's deploying right now to that resource group. And guess what? Look at this. Our deployment is in progress. So the next step we're going to do is hopefully our deployment goes very, very quickly. And when it does, we're going to go right into that storage account and we're going to look for our container. Once we get to our container section, we're going to create that container and hopefully upload some images into that container. But look at that. Deployment is complete. We are good to go. So let's go straight to that resource. Now, as you can see here, this is our resource. It's in our resource group. We have our storage account with all those numbers. But what I want to do on the left side, I want to go to data storage. The first thing I want to look at is I'm going to go straight to containers. Now, in containers, you can see I already have a couple. What I want to do is create a container. So this container, we're going to call it AZ900. Oh, and look at that. Again, I didn't follow my rules. Remember, has to be lowercase. So we're going to go ahead and call it AZ900, and that's good to go. Because again, container doesn't have to be universal. The storage does. So we're going to go ahead and create it. And there we go. Let's click on that container AZ900. So here, 
what we're looking at is what can we do? Well, I told you we're going to upload some images. So let's go ahead and click upload. I'm going to go ahead and click upload and it's going to ask me to select a file. So I'm going to click here where it's to select a file. Now I have some images ready to go. So I'm going to go straight to my, you see right here where it says Azure 900 demos. I have some stored images. I'm going to double click on that. And then right here, I have one ready to go. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it and hit open. Now, once I have it ready to go, I'm going to go ahead and click upload. So let's upload that into our container. Now, ideally here, look at how quick that container uploaded. That was instant. So if I close the blob, I'm going to go ahead and click right here on that image. So click on image. Okay, and it says riddle. So again, one of the fun things you can do is, you know, put whatever you want here. So I'm going to copy this to my clipboard. I'm going to open a new tab in my browser, and I'm going to enter it into the browser. So I'm going to click here, paste that in here. Boom, look at that. Our riddle, our image is hosted right there, and it's easily accessible. Look how great that was. And it was instant. Why was it instant? Why was it so fast? Well, that's because of the access tier. So let's take a look at it again, right? Here we have Riddle, and look at that access tier. It says hot. That's right. We want it to have the quickest uptime. So what I can do, actually, is if I go to Riddle, okay, as you can see, we have the option to change the tier. Now, if I wanted to, I could take it from hot, I could switch it to cool, I could even change it to archive. And again, this doesn't go simply for that container. Let's say I have other storage accounts and other containers. So let's look at this one. I also have a container here with a couple of different images and pictures. Now, let's take a look at this one that says dog. Okay, I'm going to copy this one as well and I'm going to paste it. So let's take a look. And this is, oh, I mean, look at that. Is that not one of the cutest things you've ever seen? Now, it's not limited to images because remember, this is the unstructured data. So if we click on this text file and copy it to the clipboard as well, let's take a look at what this says. Well, look at that. It says, hello, everyone, dash Josh, probably one of my most famous quotes. But that shows you not only how easy it is to create a storage account and a container, but how fast we can have images ready to go and ready to share. And that concludes our demonstration. Okay, <laughs> now that we've finished that fantastic demo, again, probably my favorite, let's talk about Azure Migrate. It's essentially the hub of all of your migration to the cloud because it has its own hub and its own tooling. Now, Azure Migrate is a free service. So as long as you're not using a third-party tooling, it's free. But Azure Migrate allows you to use a comprehensive approach to migrate your application and data center's estate. Now, you can also get support for key migration workloads like uh, Windows, SQL, Linux server, databases, data, web apps, and even virtual desktops. And Azure Migrate allows you to migrate to destinations, including Azure Virtual Machines, VMware Solution, Azure App Service, and Azure SQL Database. Migrations are holistic across a VMware, Hyper-V, physical server, and cloud-to-cloud -cloud migration. And more importantly, it also works with other cloud services, and its native tooling is with Windows and Linux. Now let's talk about Azure Data Box. This, this is going to be one of my favorite topics because the Microsoft Azure Data Box cloud solution lets you send terabytes of data into and out of Azure in a quick, inexpensive, and reliable way. Now, the secure data transfer is accelerated by shipping you a proprietary Data Box storage device. Now, each storage device has a maximum usable storage capacity of 80 terabytes, and it's transported to your data center through a regional carrier. 
Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, that doesn't sound safe. Don't worry. The device has a rugged casing to protect and secure data during the transit. You can even order the data box via the Azure portal to either import or export data from Azure. And once the device is received, you can very quickly set it up using the local web UI. And depending on whether you'll import or export data, whether you're copying the data from your server to the device or from the device to your servers, you can ship the device back to Azure. And if you're importing data to Azure in the Azure Data Center, your data is automatically uploaded from the device to Azure. And the entire process is tracked meticulously end to end by the Databox service in the Azure portal. And Databox is typically used for many reasons, right? Whether you want to import a one-time migration, whether you want to do an initial bulk transfer, whether they're periodic uploads, or let's say you want to export data for disaster recovery, for security requirements. Heck, you know what? Maybe you want to migrate back to on-premises or even to another cloud service provider. Why you would, I don't know. But whatever the case, Azure Databox is perfect for those migrations because not only is Databox fast with either a one gig or a 10 gig per second network interface, but it is also incredibly secure. So let's go over our file management options. Let's start with AZ Copy. AZ Copy is a command line utility that you can use to copy blobs or files to or from your storage account. Now with AZ Copy, you can upload files, download files, copy files between storage accounts, and even synchronize files. Now AZ Copy can be configured to work with other cloud providers to help move files back and forth between clouds. Important note, okay? Synchronizing blobs or files with AZ Copy is unidirectional, so it's a one direction synchronization. When you synchronize, you designated the source and destination, and AZ Copy will copy files or blobs in that direction. It doesn't synchronize bi-directionally based on timestamps or any other metadata. Now let's talk Azure Storage Explorer. Azure Storage Explorer is a standalone application that provides a graphical interface to manage files and blobs in your Azure Storage account. Now it works on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux operating systems, and actually uses AZ Copy on the back end to perform all of the file and blob management tasks. Now with Storage Explorer, you can upload to Azure, download from Azure, or even move between storage accounts. And finally, you have Azure File Sync. Azure File Sync is a tool that lets you centralize your file shares in Azure Files and keep the flexibility, performance, and compatibility of a Windows file server. It's, it's almost like turning your Windows file server into a miniature content delivery network. Because once you install Azure File Sync on your local Windows server, it will automatically stay bi-directionally synced with your files in Azure. Now with Azure File Sync, you can use any protocol that's available on Windows Server to access your data, whether it's locally, you know, things like SMB, NFS, and FTPS. You can have as many caches as you need across the entire world. You can even replace a failed local server by installing Azure File Sync on a new server in the same data center. And of course, you can configure cloud tiering so the most frequently accessed files are replicated locally, whereas infrequently accessed files are kept in the cloud until request. When we come back from the break, we'll start off with our next lesson.
Welcome back. And in this section, we're going to talk about some of the <laughs> different identity services inside of Azure. Things like Azure Active Directory and how you can leverage tools like multi-factor authentication, also known as MFA, and conditional access to ensure that even if someone is able to obtain someone else's password, that they still need to take some extra steps to verify that they are who they truly say they are. Now let's talk about our first topic in identity, access, and security, and that's Azure Active Directory. What Azure Active Directory does is it allows us to basically have a cloud-based identity solution that's similar to Active Directory that you would have in your on-premises environment. But there are some key differences. Now in this course, we're not gonna go through all the differences between the two, but what I'd like you to know is that Azure Active Directory can be used in conjunction with your on-premises Active Directory. And it can even be used as a standalone environment. And the way that Azure Active Directory works is you can connect both your external resources, so things like Office 365, like the Azure portal itself, or any number of other softwares that you might use in your organization, and you can connect it with your internal resources like your corporate network or your corporate internet. There's even device management tools that allow you to connect the two together. Now where Azure Active Directory really just starts to show its power is in the different services that it can provide. So one of the main things that we see it being used for would be for authentication as well as single sign-on. Now remember what authentication is at its core, right? All we're doing is we're identifying that whoever is requesting access, that they are who they say they are, that they are an approved user. So normally, as an employee, I'm going to enter my username and password to sign on. With Azure Active Directory, you can leverage single sign-on. So as an employee, I'm going to need access to things, right? Let's say I need access to an application. Let's say I need access to the portal. And let's say I need access to, you know, internet files. I need to access a couple of things. So I need authentication. And we know that an option, which we're going to delve into a little bit deeper, is multi-factor authentication. But with single sign-on, I only have to remember one username and one password. And from an admin's perspective, whew, it makes far more sense because it makes your environment far more secure because now that user is tied to a role versus the user having a number of different accounts and a number of different usernames and a number of different passwords. So let's say, again, I have a user who needs access to their application, to the Azure portal, and needs access to, you know, internet files or their company email. Well, instead of having your admin set up an account for each and every single one, well, they can just tie that user to a role. And that user is given access to all of those different products and services. So in the event that they you know, leave the company, change roles, or promote it, well, you're just disabling that user. That is going to take care of all of their access. Because the other option would be having to remember every single thing that they had access to and removing them from each individual platform. So single sign-on is not only great from a user perspective, right? Because you have to remember one username and one password, but it also makes your administrator's jobs easier. Now, some of the other areas where Azure Active Directory comes into play is when you use application management services. You can use application management services like the My Apps portal, okay, which you can use both for your cloud application as well as your on-premises applications. And it gives you one place to manage all of your applications. And if you're working with things like vendors or external partners or even guest users, you can leverage Azure Active Directory as their sign-on and control what they have access to and what they're authorized to use. And the same thing goes for your customers and how they're interacting with your organizations. Think of um, things like self-service portals. And finally, you can use Azure Active Directory to help manage your devices and what they can do 
with your corporate data. But, but, before we go any further, let's talk about the difference between authentication and authorization. Now, authentication is where we have to prove that we are who we say we are. So essentially, if I say, hi there, I'm Josh Rodriguez, then I have to prove that I am, in fact, Josh Rodriguez. Now, there are a number of ways I could prove that, right? I could use my username. I could put my password. It could be a security question where I have to answer, you know, hey, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream, which always will be cookies and cream. Well, let me tell you a quick story. So my wife and I love to travel. And I'm, I'm blessed because she's one of those amazing people who somehow, no idea how, finds flights super cheap. So for example, true story, we flew from New Jersey to Paris once for $50 each. That's right, $50 each. So, of course, we were excited, we were ready. But before I could realize it, when we got to the airport, we went through both an authentication process and an authorization process. So first, we had the authentication. And remember, authentication is where we have to prove that we are who we say we are. Because if we weren't, then why would we say we were? Because whatever the process, I have to answer things that only Josh Rodriguez should be able to answer. And in this case, when we first got to the airport on our Paris getaway, we had to go through security and TSA. Well, typically, there are you know, those agents and they give you the wave to come forward and they ask you to present two items. So they asked me, please, sir, present your ID and your boarding pass. So they grabbed my ID and boarding pass. They held it up to the light. You know, they said, okay, that's good. They made sure it matched the boarding pass. And they made sure that I matched the ID. I was authenticated. So once they authenticate you and they say, congratulations, you are who you say you are, then they let you go through, right? And then you got to do that fun airport dance where you got to dump all of your liquid, take off your shoes, empty your pockets, put everything in those large bins, go through the big machine, go through the big machine, raise your hands and get through everything, right? <laughs> and then comes the second part. Now, after you put on your shoes, comes the authorization, which really controls what level of access you have. Remember our boarding pass, right? Our fantastic $50 boarding pass. Well, on our boarding pass, it had a gate number on it, it had a row, it had a seat number, a boarding time, time when the doors closed, it had a plane number, destination, so much more information. But let's look at my ticket, right? My ticket said, gate 10, row 25, seat B, <sighs> the middle seat. <laughs> and I was sitting in coach, right? I mean, for $50, you know, I'm definitely sitting in coach. But it said it was boarding at 10 a.m. and the doors closed at 10.30. Now, no matter how amazing I am and how convincing I can be, right, that's my seat. That's my flight. I am authorized for those exact parameters. Because no matter how badly I wanted to take a first-class flight, I'm not authorized for that. No matter how badly I wanted to go to Aruba instead of Paris, I'm not authorized for that. No. I was authorized to sit in my seat, my middle seat, all the way to Paris. I'm going to a specific location. I have a specific seat. So when we look at creating a secure identity solution inside of our Azure environments, we need to make sure that not only are we having users authenticate themselves, again, proving that they are who they say they are, but then we are providing, remember this term, the least amount of access. In other words, we're only authorizing them for the work that they need at the time that they need it. And we'll talk about some different controls that support that. Let's start with Azure Multi-Factor Authentication, also known as MFA. Now, passwords aren't the most secure way to protect your environment because guess what? People forget their passwords or they share them or even worse, they write it down on a sticky note and put it right on their computers. Now, the most common password in the United States 
is actually password one, two, three. It's true. Look it up. <laughs> we shouldn't rely on passwords, right? Because instead of just relying on your password, we can leverage something called multi-factor authentication. Now remember, authentication, we're proving that we are who we say we are. Now in this case, what we do is we have multi-factor authentication. So we have three different options of things that we can provide. Number one, we can provide something you know. For example, I know my password or I know an answer to a security question, right? I know my username, so I'm going to have to enter something that only I should know. I stress should because unfortunately, some people share usernames and passwords, okay? It's something only you should know. Number two, it could be something that you possess. For example, we have things like keys. Maybe you're generating a secure key that you have to enter. Maybe it's a key that generates every 30 seconds. Maybe it's an ID badge or an authenticator app that you have on your phone. Whatever it is, it's something that only you should have. And then number three, it's something you are. Now, something you are are your biometric properties. So think of, you know, face scanning, fingerprint sensors, voice recognition, heck, even retinal scans. Uh -huh. But essentially, what multi-factor authentication is doing is you're authenticating, meaning you're proving that you are who you say you are in more than just one way. So, okay. it could cool. be entering yeah. your Thanks password, you know, password one, two, three, plus Great. entering a code that was Great. texted yeah, to your personal sure, yeah. phone number. Okay, yeah. So, even Control if someone in. somehow has your okay. password right. and right. it's compromised, well, hopefully you still have your cell phone so you can deny that access. Now, another example is, yes, I was able to scan in with my face but I still need to enter a password as well. Leveraging multiple forms of authentication can actually make your environment more secure. And there's a great statistic that says that using MFA versus a traditional password makes your environment 99.9% .9 more secure. And inside of Azure, we have the ability to leverage multi-factor authentication with Azure Active Directory. And in Azure Active Directory, we have multiple types of identities. So let's start with the external identities. In Azure, we have those external identities. And Azure AD external identities refers to all the ways that you can securely interact with users that are outside of your organization. So if you want to collaborate with partners, distributors, suppliers, vendors, well, you can share your resources and define how your internal users can access external organizations. Now, if you're a developer creating consumer-facing apps, well, you can manage your customers' identity experiences. Now, with external identities, external users can bring their own identities. Now, whether they have a corporate or government-issued digital identity or an unmanaged social identity like Google or Facebook, they can use their own credentials to sign in. Azure Active Directory AD, so B2B collaboration, is a feature within external identities that lets you invite guest users to collaborate with your organization. With B2B collaboration, you can securely share your company's applications and services with external users while still maintaining control over your own corporate data. With this, you can work safely and securely with external partners, large or small, even if they don't have Azure AD, even if they don't have an IT department. A simple invitation of redemption process lets partners use their own credentials to access your company's resources. You can also enable self-service sign-up user flows to let external users sign up for apps or resources themselves. And once the external user has redeemed their invitation or completed the sign-up, they're represented in your directory as a user object. Now, B2B collaboration user objects are typically given a uh, user type of guest and can be identified by, you know, the hashtag extension hashtag or hashtag EXT hashtag extension in their user principal name. Developers can use Azure AD business to business APIs to customize the invitation process or write applications like, 
you know, self-service sign-up portals. From there, we move on to our other external identity, which is external identity B2C. Now, Azure AD B2C is a customer identity and access management, a CIAM, also known as a CM. It's a CM solution that lets you build user journeys for consumer and customer facing apps. So if you're a business or individual developer creating customer facing apps, you can scale to millions of consumers, customers, or citizens by using Azure AD B2C. A developer can use Azure AD B2C as the full featured CM system for their applications. And with Azure AD B2C, customers can sign in with an identity that they've already established. Okay, so again, that they've already established like Facebook or Gmail. And you can completely customize and control how customers sign up, how they sign in, and how they manage their profiles when using your applications. Now, although Azure AD B2C is built on the same technology as Azure AD, it is a separate service with some feature differences. Let's talk conditional access. So in conditional access, let's say for example, okay, you have someone trying to sign in. So let's say you have an employee named Thomas, okay? And Thomas is trying to sign in from his non-corporate device. Well, because he's signing in with the correct credentials, but it's not the approved corporate device, well, what we can do is we can actually require a multi-factor authentication and we request Thomas to, you know, text a code or email a code that he has to prove that not only is he who he says he is, because again, he knows his username and password, but we're also, we're just requesting that extra verification because he's not logging in from his regular device. Or let's say, for example, Thomas is using his corporate device. And while yes, good job, Thomas, you're logging in from your corporate device. Well, Thomas is connecting from a non-corporate network and trying to access a very secure document and file. Now, I could take two options here. Now, because he's meeting one of the two requirements, right? Yes, he does have his corporate device, but he does have his corporate network. Well, I can require MFA or I can simply just block that access because he's not on our corporate network. So the best way to think of conditional access is to think of it of if then statement. So if Thomas is signing in on a corporate device and Thomas is on the corporate network, then we're going to require multi-factor authentication. However, if Thomas is connecting from his non-corporate device and he's connected to the network, then I'll require maybe MFA or maybe just deny him completely. But worst case scenario, if Thomas is connected from a non-corporate device on a non-corporate network, then sorry, Thomas, you're not meeting any of them. You're getting denied automatically. Remember, conditional access is a tool that Azure Active Directory uses to allow or deny access to resources based on identity signals. Now, these signals include who the user is, where the user is, and what device the user is requesting access from. So now that we know about conditional access, let us start with roles. Now, remember how I told you Azure Active Directory can help support your roles by assigning them? Well, Role-Based Access Control, or RBAC for short, think of this as your, your authorization, right? What are you allowing your users to do now? What I usually recommend when it comes to their role-based access is you want to provide the users with the least amount of access possible to do their job, okay? The least amount of access possible to do their job because RBAC or role-based access control, it's what we call an allow model. And an allow model means that when you give someone a role within RBAC, you are basically saying, this is what you can do. So you're giving them authorization. Whether they're allowed to read, whether you're allowing them to write, whether you're allowing them to delete. So if you have one role, let's say I have a role for a resource group that allows me to read a resource group, but then let's say I have another role 
that allows me to write to that research group, well, the write role is going to override the read only because this gives me the most access. So you want to be really aware when you're assigning roles that you're not conflicting because whatever is giving you the most access is going to override the other roles. Now, what are some cases where you might use role-based access control? Let's say, for example, I wanted to have my database administrator, okay, we'll call him Pedro, okay? We wanted him to read and write access to my SQL databases in a subscription, but I don't want Pedro to have access to anything else. Well, I could have varying roles and each with different access. And that, that can just get really confusing. That's where Azure Active Directory can help me manage all of that. Because when it comes to setting up your role-based access control, an important thing to remember is to segregate your duties. That's one of the first things you need to do. Segregate your duties and make sure that you're only given the access that is required to do their job. Now there's a saying, okay? And it's that you should only trust people as far as you can throw them. I'm not saying go and throw your coworkers, okay? That's not what we're teaching here. And I'm not saying everyone's bad, okay? What I am saying is no one is perfect. Mistakes happen. And your goal is to limit the potential risk that you're exposed to. And in the future, you can always grant additional access. But it's far more difficult. It's far more difficult to allow a lot of access, learn the hard way, and then begin restricting. No, you'd be better off to start off with limited access and grant more access along the way. It's like my grandma used to say, imagine a tub of toothpaste. It's easy to take the toothpaste out. And while, yes, it's technically not impossible to get it back in, it's a lot more difficult to do so. And within Azure, we help you. You have a vast list of built-in roles ready to go inside of Azure. You don't like those? No problem. You can create your own roles. You can define them. You can see who has been assigned what role. You can see who's a contributor, who's an owner, who's a reader. And in the portal, you can even deny assignments. Remember, because it is an allow model, give people the least amount of access and grant more as needed. Now from there, let's talk defense. Now defense in depth. Okay, defense in depth is where we're utilizing a series of mechanisms to help slow down the advancement attack that's trying to get unauthorized access to our data because that's what we're trying to protect. That is Azure's ultimate goal, to protect data, period, end of story. And truthfully, your goal should align. That should be your goal, to protect your data. Now, when it comes to the defense in depth, we have multiple layers here. Our first line of defense is our physical security. Now, that physical security building and you know, controlling access to computing hardware within the data center, those are our physical security, right? I have a coworker that's worked at a few data centers to the extent of security cameras, personnel, access controls, all of these things are in place, even inside of the data center. And that's just a drop in the ocean of all the physical security protocols Microsoft has in place. Now the second layer, second layer is securing our identity and access. And we actually just talked about that. But this is done through control access to accounts, subscription, and resources. Okay, again, here we're securing identity and access. And we're doing that by using capabilities in Azure Active Directory, like single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, device management, and so much more. Now, even through auditing events and changes, Microsoft is still ensuring your identity and access are secure. Now, our third layer. Our third layer is our perimeter. And we like to think of 
our perimeter as you know a logical perimeter okay for my fantasy fans out there think of this like the castle walls okay the goal here is to prevent any unwanted users or services from accessing our network our applications our containers and so on okay here we have tons of Azure services to help secure the perimeter layer, okay? Because what do we want to do? We want to stop them right there. We don't want them to get any further. They shall not pass the perimeter layer. But what if it happens? What if unwanted users do get access to your network? What if they breach the gates, right? Well, in our network layer, our strategy changes because this is where you as a customer can set up rules within Azure to limit communication and access to your resource if there is a chance that there's an attempt or unwanted access on your network. You do this to ensure that there's no unwanted access that can reach any of your other resources. The idea here is that we stop anything from spreading and where appropriate you can even limit or restrict inbound and outbound internet access. Now in the compute layer, protection can be in the form of securing access to virtual machines and even keeping systems patched and current, right? Not opening unnecessary ports and looking at ways to harden your virtual machines. In the application layer, well here we want to make sure that we're taking the necessary precautions with our code as well as add security within it. We want to take advantage of Azure Key Vault, for example, with our secrets and our encryption keys and certificates and have that help as well. We want to make sure that our developers are integrating security into our application's design. So that way, it's secure by default. And then data. Data is ultimately what we want to protect the most. This is our king and queen. And as I love to say it, <laughs> This is the soft and delicious nougatty center. This is the core of all of our apps and services. Because in addition to all other layers mentioned that are there to help protect your data, you also want to consider ensuring your data is protected at rest and in transit. Again, as we see here, this is a layered approach with many different parties becoming involved in sharing that security responsibility. And this security responsibility does not fall solely on Microsoft. Because remember, they're the cloud provider. But like with everything, it's shared between you, the customer, and Microsoft, the provider. Now let's move on to another concept. And this is called zero trust. Now zero trust is a concept that assumes that everything, everything is on an open and untrusted network. That's right, even your own corporate network. Now I know what many of you are thinking. Well, I'm secure, Josh. I know that my devices can be trusted. I am super safe. Well, that's great. And I hope that's true, I really do. But the idea here is that by starting up with that zero trust methodology, this allows us to build a foundation where we can approach our security concepts and the tools that we use with that mindset. And to that point, we've seen over the past couple of years how much the traditional office has evolved. We're seeing more and more employees working from home. Now, that, as great as it is, that's a liability when it comes to security. So we had to adapt. And that's what leads us to our three guiding principles of zero trust. Our first guiding principle is going to be verifying user access explicitly. Now the definition for explicitly is as follows. <clears throat> In a clear and detailed manner, leaving no room for confusion or doubt. So again, we want to verify in such a way that it leaves no room for confusion or doubt. Our second guiding principle is going to be least privileged access. And we've talked about this before, okay? The idea here is to give the least possible amount of access that is needed for an employee to do their job without any issues. Again, 
as great as I'm sure everyone is, no one, no one is perfect. And our third guiding principle is going to be assume breach. Now, this is the idea that limits the trust placed in applications, services, identities, and networks by treating them all, all internal and external, as insecure and already compromised. And this, this is what allows us to build our defenses accordingly. Remember, those are our three guiding principles of zero trust. We also have tools that can help us. And one of my favorite tools is Microsoft Defender for the Cloud. Now, Microsoft Defender for Cloud is a cloud workload protection platform, also known as a CWPP. Now, this also delivers Cloud Security Posture Management, CSPM, for all of your Azure, on-premises, and multi-cloud resources. Now, it has three main benefits to it. Let's begin with recommendations. Now, Defender for Cloud gives recommendations that identify cloud workloads that require security actions and provide you with steps to protect your workloads from security risks. Defender for Cloud also has a secure score It gives you a clear view of your security posture based on the implementation of those security recommendations. This way, you can track new security opportunities and report on the progress of your security efforts. And finally, Defender for Cloud has alerts, alerts that warn you about security events in your workloads in real time, including the indicators that led to that event. Now through Defender, you have policy compliance, Uh, continuous assessments, tailored recommendations, constant threat protection, tons of different things. But it's important to remember that while Defender is giving recommendations, remember they are simply that, recommendations. If your organization doesn't want to follow the recommendations, they're not required to do so. But they may run things differently to what's being recommended. Now, in Microsoft Defender for the Cloud, Remember, we're gonna be able to connect it to other external parties. So for example, we'll be able to connect it to GCP, AWS. So if we were to go into the cloud, we will be able to see all those recommendations. We would be able to look at different resources. We would be able to look at different clouds. We even would be able to get our secure score that would help us understand what exactly we need to fix. But again, those are recommendations. It's entirely up to you if you want to do them. Your organization may have a different way of doing things, and that's absolutely okay. Because again, there are recommendations. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about cost management. So let's start by looking at the multiple factors that can affect cost. Let's start off with our resource type. Now your resource type is so important because every resource has a usage meter associated with it. And depending on that resource type, That usage meter can be measured in a number of different ways. And we've looked at tons of different services. We've looked at um, storage accounts, we've looked at virtual machines, and we've looked at SQL databases. And depending on the service, that service may even rely on certain components of other services. So it's not just a service of the cost of that service. And each service can have different versions of that service. So different costs are associated with each different service. For example, remember when we looked at our storage accounts? Well, each storage account or each storage service has a different cost associated with it. Using Azure Blob Storage, it's gonna have a different cost than if we were to use Azure Files. And even if we look specifically at Azure Blob Storage, well, we have options. If we store it in a hot tier, that's gonna be a different cost. If we store it in a cold tier, that's gonna be a different cost. And if we store it in an archive tier, that's a different cost. So again, you're going to be exposed to different costs for different access tiers. And that goes for every single resource and service in the cloud. Number two, we're looking at consumption. Of course, pay as you go has been a consistent theme throughout our lessons. And that's where the cloud payment model really comes into play is there we're paying for the resources that we use during a set billing cycle. 
Now let's say we decided in one billing cycle we're going to use a lot of compute, more than we normally would. Well, simply we're paying more. We're not penalized for going over, right? We're just paying for what we use. Well, let's say the next month we're using less. Again, we paid for what we use. So we're not charged more than what we use. It's a very straightforward pricing mechanism that allows for maximum flexibility. However, Azure also offers the ability to commit to using a set amount of cloud resources in advance and receiving discounts on those reserved resources. This is called Azure Reserve Instances. And many services, including databases, compute, and storage, all provide the option to commit to a level of use and receive a discount. And how good is that discount? In some cases, all the way up to 72%. So I'll give you an example here. I recently uh, signed a contract for my apartment, a lease, and I signed for two years. Now, when I signed, I knew the first thing I needed is I needed to contact my internet provider and figure out what my internet costs were going to be. So my internet provider told me, hey, Josh, how are you? We want to let you know that if you decided to go month to month, you're going to be paying $50 a month. And I said, okay. He said, but if you commit to one year, we'll drop that down to $40 a month. And what's more, if you commit to two years, we'll drop that all the way down to $30 a month. So I said, well, you know, barring any unforeseen circumstances, I know I'm going to be in this apartment for the next two years. So I took the two-year deal. And by doing so, I saved about 40% of that cost. Now, another thing that we can use is called the Azure Hybrid Use Benefit. Now, just like restaurants have BYOB, right? Bring your own beverage. Azure has BYOL, bring your own licenses. So if you have a Windows or a SQL license, well, bring it with you. Come on down and use your own licenses to save money. So let's go back to that scenario again for that example, right? My internet provider said, okay, Josh, we just wanted to let you know you committed to the $30 uh, for that two-year contract. But we're going to provide you the equipment. Now, providing you the equipment is going to cost you $5 additional per month. Well, I told them, hey, I actually have my own equipment. He said, whoa, that's great. If you actually provide your own equipment, instead of us charging you $5, we actually give you a discount of $5. So I said, that's great. So I used my own equipment. And by using my own equipment, okay, that, you know, hybrid cloud benefit, and by using those reserved instances, right, committing to that two years, instead of paying $50 a month, I was only paying $25 a month. So that's what we're talking about when it comes to consumption. You can save a lot of money depending on how you're consuming. Now let's talk about maintenance. Now the flexibility of the cloud makes it possible to just rapidly adjust resources based on demand. And using resource groups, as we talked about, can help keep all of your resources organized. But in order to control costs, it is so important to maintain your cloud environment. For example, every time you provision a virtual machine, as we know, additional resources such as storage, networking, you know, virtual networks, those are all provisioned. Those are also created. So if you deprovision the virtual machine, sometimes those additional resources may not be deprovisioned at the same time, whether you stop them or you delete them. And sometimes, either intentionally or unintentionally, you may be unfortunately keeping those resources. But by keeping an eye on your resources and making sure you're not keeping around resources that you no longer need, you can help control cloud costs. Things, I'll give you a quick example. I paid for you know, a, a membership for a location that I never even went to, right? And I paid that every single month. By the time I realized it, I spent hundreds of dollars. So by just keeping maintenance of your environment, you're avoiding spending unnecessarily. Let's go to number four. That's geography. 
when you provision resources in Azure, most resources in Azure, you need to define a region where the resource deploys. Now, Azure infrastructure is distributed globally, right? This enables you to deploy your services either centrally, right? Closest to your customer or something in between. But with this global deployment comes global pricing difference. The cost of power, labor, taxes, and fees will vary depending on the location. And due to these variations, Azure resources can or most likely will differ in cost to deploy depending on the region. And that's so important because not just are the costs, but network traffic is also impacted based on the geography. For example, it's less expensive to move information within Europe than to move information from Europe to Asia or South Africa. And that's what network traffic is, which is number five. But to help with that, we have things called billing zones. Now, billing zones are a factor in determining the cost of some Azure services. Because now we look at bandwidth. And bandwidth refers to data moving in and out of Azure data centers. Now, some inbound data transfers, in other words, data going into Azure centers, they're free, right? Sometimes it's not. And for outbound data transfers, so data leaving Azure data centers, the pricing is based on the zone as well. And the zone is a geographical grouping of Azure regions for billing purposes. So it's important to know where is my data going? And last but not least, we have the subscription type. Now, depending on what subscription type you have, your spend, your discount, your usage allowances, all those things are going to vary. And due to this, it's going to affect your costs. Because even with the free subscription, which you should all sign up for, <laughs> not only are you getting free access to the portal, but you get even credits and certain things. So things that someone that would go web direct wouldn't be able to get. What's an easy way to calculate all of this? Well, that's why we look at the pricing calculator. Now, the pricing calculator is going to show us that there are resources that will help us reduce our costs. It's based on the idea that you're adding to your existing subscription. Now, if you are planning or want to an estimate on migrating or moving your current infrastructure to Azure, then this is not the tool for you. We'll talk about that tool next. The pricing calculators you have an existing subscription and want to take a look at, you know, how much things will cost in your existing subscription. Now, I could talk about it all day, but instead, let me show you. All right, for this demonstration, we're going to look at one of my favorite tools, and that is the pricing calculator. Now, with the pricing calculator, again, remember, this is if you have an existing subscription or you want to just, you know, get some estimates as if you already had a subscription. If you're looking to migrate to the cloud, this is not your tool. That tool is the TCO, and we'll show that very, very soon. So this is the pricing calculator, and right here we have the option of adding services and resources for estimates. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to add a storage account, and I'm going to add a virtual machine. So as we scroll down, we're going to see that they've both have been added. So what I want you to notice, remember, what was that first factor that affected cost, right? Resource type. Well, look here. Your storage account is going to be about $150.69 a month for a storage account. Now, if we scroll past the storage account and look at our virtual machine, where our virtual machine is about $152.62 a month. So right then and there you'll see that the storage account and the virtual machine have a different cost because they're different resources. Now, what we can actually do is we can take that a step further and we can look at the type of virtual machine that we have. So as you can see in this instance right now, we're getting charged about 20.9 cents an hour. Now, if I were to click here in the instance, you're gonna see that we get from 20 cents an hour to 66 cents an hour and then we can even find ones that are, look at this, $10 an hour. No, no, no. I'm going to stay with my 21 cents an hour. I'm good there. But again, that just goes to show you that resource type affects cost. 
Does anyone know what our second one was? Right? That's consumption. Now, consumption, remember how I talked about my landlord, how I talked about my lease, how I talked about my internet provider? Well, guess what? Right now, we have a virtual machine. Now, if I scroll down, you're going to see here we have two options. These are our savings options. So the first one on the left, this is our reserved instances. Look, if I pay as I go, I'm paying $152.50 a month. However, if I commit to one year reserve, I'm dropping down to $125.08. And you know what? Why don't we commit a little bit more? Let's commit to three years and drop that all the way down to $104.21. Now I'm going to reset it to pay as you go just so we can see the difference in cost. Look at that. We're talking almost $50 a month. Now calculate that over three years, carry the one. That's a lot of money, okay? That's a lot of money we're saving. How about our bring your own license? Remember that? The hybrid benefit? Well, that's right here. As you can see, if we include the license, we're paying $152.57 a month. However, if we already have our own Windows licenses, well, we can take advantage of that Azure hybrid benefit and drop it all the way down to $85.41. Now, I know what you're thinking, and I'm one step ahead of you. What if we combine both the reserved instance and the hybrid benefit? Well, then we go from paying $152.57 all the way down to $37.00. And five cents. I mean, we're getting this virtual machine on clearance. What a deal! And that shows you consumption matters, right? How we're paying for this or how we're saving money on this is going to determine and factor into our cost. Let's go ahead and reset back to the standard. What was our third one? Does anyone remember? That's right, maintenance. Now, if we look at maintenance, remember that. We need to maintain our cloud environment. We need to make sure that whatever we're paying for is being used. And if it's not being used, we're turning that off. Because take a look at this virtual machine. That's $152.57 a month. And if that virtual machine is on but not doing anything, we're, we're, we're burning money. We're wasting it. We're wasting $152.57 per month. Why? Because we're not properly maintaining our environment. That's why maintenance is so important. Because that cost can quickly, I mean very quickly, scale up. Now our fourth one was geography. So I want everyone to take a notice, okay? Now, within the screen, at, unfortunately at the polar opposite ends, you have your region, and then you have the cost. But I want you to look at this. Right now, it's deploying out of West US's data center. But if I were to move it, let's say to Canada, okay? So let's say Canada East. Well, then look at that. We dropped all the way down to 148.19. Canada's great. But is anyone greater? Let's take a look. What if we went to, I don't know, East US? Let's go to East US. Well, East US, oh, look at that. $137.24. Uh, I think we're going to go there. That's awesome. Now, what if I wanted to go, I don't know, a little south? Let's go south of the border. Let's go to uh, Brazil. Yeah, let's go to Brazil Southeast. Right now, we're paying $137.24. Let's go ahead and deploy it in Brazil Southeast. Uh, never mind. We're not deploying in Brazil Southeast because that's $218.27. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to deploy out of US East. I'm happy. But remember that other 
factor. Factor number five, the network traffic. Depending on where you know, my services are going or where my data is going in and out of, maybe, while yes, it may be more expensive monthly to go in Brazil Southeast, what if all my data is going in and out of Brazil? Well, I'm deploying in East US. So while the monthly charge may be cheaper, at the end of the month, when you add on those data charges, it might actually be far more expensive. So it's always important to note what your network traffic costs are going to be. And last, with our pricing calculator, we're looking at subscription. Now I want everyone to notice here, I am using the pricing calculator and the pricing calculator is basically assuming that you're going on portal.azure.com. So this is the retail view. Now outside of you know, your reserved instances and your Azure hybrid benefit, we're not receiving any additional discounts because remember, the last factor that affects cost is your subscription type. So that is why the pricing calculator is such a great tool. We can see, we can get estimates of what our spend is going to be. Now that was the pricing calculator, but let's take a close look at this slide. As you can see here, the majority of the cost actually comes from the data center. 93% of it is coming from the data center. But when you move to the cloud, when you migrate, because we're in the public cloud, and even if it's just IaaS or infrastructure as a service, we're no longer having that physical responsibility. That means that 93% cost that you see there doesn't get reduced. It's completely gone. Now, while yes, there is a slight increase in cost for compute and a bigger increase in networking cost percentage-wise, percentage-wise, Look at the total cost. That is outstanding savings. We went from a roughly $30 million cost all the way down to under $600,000. That's the power and impact that having this calculator can. You move to the cloud and you can save millions. That's what the TCO calculator is for. It's migration to the cloud. And remember that the TCO calculator, this takes everything into account, not just infrastructure, not just your other costs, but it takes into account electricity costs, rent, and many other factors that go into your total cost. Hence the name, total cost of ownership calculator. And just like the pricing calculator, we could talk about this all day, but instead, let me show. For this demonstration, we're gonna do a quick overview of the total cost of ownership calculator. Remember, the TCO calculator estimates the cost savings that you can realize by migrating your workloads to Azure. So this is the calculator you want if you're currently on premises and want to migrate to the cloud. Now, why is it so good? Because it actually goes into a quick three-step process. Your first step, is you're defining your workloads. And it is very important that you're accurate when defining those workloads. So let's take a look. The first thing we do is define our servers so we can add our server workload. And as you can see, it's a very detailed process. You're looking at your workload, your environment, operating systems, licenses, servers, course per pro, I mean, all this information. But again, it's vital that it's accurate. So that way you can get an accurate estimate. From there, you're gonna enter your databases. After your databases, your storage, then your networking, and you're gonna talk about your outbound bandwidth. Once you do all of that, you can go ahead and click next. And then from there, you're gonna adjust the assumptions. And as you can see here, the TCO helps you out with all of that. It's incredibly easy for you. It's literally flipping switches. You're also going to go into your electricity costs, your storage costs, your IT labor costs, and other assumptions. And as you can see, there are a ton of them. Once you do that, you're gonna go ahead and click next. And then it's gonna take you to your last step, and that's viewing the report. Once you view the report, it's going to give you a detailed breakdown. 
not only how much you're saving, but why you would be saving that amount. Again, the TCO calculator is made for migration. So if you're going from on-premises to the cloud, the TCO calculator is your best tool. Now that we know how the pricing impacts when you're working and choosing your services, right? We know the type of customers we're going to impact. We know where we're deploying it. But sometimes, sometimes, even when we take all of those factors into consideration, well, we still want to make sure what our spend is going to be. We want to be able to predict costs. We want to forecast financials. We want to set budgets. We want to know what's happening with our money, with our funds. And we want to be alerted when they're not being used as intended. Well, do we have a tool for you? Say hello to Azure Cost Management. Azure Cost Management provides the ability to quickly check Azure resource costs, create alerts based on resource spend, and even create budgets that can be used to automate management of resources. Cost analysis is a subset of cost management that provides a quick visual for your Azure costs. When using cost analysis, you can actually quickly view the total cost in a variety of different ways. You can do it by billing cycle, region, resource, and so on. But with the cost management, you can set up cost alerts to let you know who is approaching their budget. And you can actually see who has exceeded it. You can set up credit alerts. You can limit and restrict department spending by you know, getting quota alerts. You can even set spending limits within Azure. Cost management is a fantastic tool that lets you understand your entire environment. Now, what's a way to make sure that we take that customization just one step further? Well, as your cloud usage grows, it's increasingly important to stay organized. We have a lot going on. It's easy to get lost. But a good organizational strategy, okay, is understanding that your cloud usage and your management costs need to be organized. And one way to organize those related resources is to place them in their own subscriptions, right? You can also use resource groups to manage related resources, right? All my virtual machines in one, all my storage accounts in one. But then we have tags. Now, resource tags are another way to organize your resources because tags provide extra information or metadata about your resources. Now, this metadata is used for a bevy of things. First, your resource management tags enable you to locate and act on resources that are associated with specific workloads, specific environments, business units, and even owners. Now, cost management and optimization tags enable you to group resources so that you can report on costs, you can allocate internal cost centers, track budgets, and even forecast what the estimated cost is going to be. And then operation management tags enable you to group resources according to you know, how critical their availability is to your business. Now, this grouping helps you formulate service level agreements, also known as SLAs, and an SLA is an uptime or performance guarantee between you and your users. Security tags enable you to classify data by its security level, such as you know, whether it's public or it's confidential. And then you have governance and regulatory compliance tags. They enable you to identify resources that align with the governance or regulatory compliance. You know, things like ISO you know, 27001. Tags can also be part of your standard enforcement efforts. For example, you might require that all resources be tagged with an owner or a department name, or even both. Now, workload optimization and automation tags, those can help you visualize all of the resources that participate in complex deployments. For example, you might tag a resource with its associated workload or application name and use software such as Azure DevOps to perform automated tasks on these resources based on that tag. And I know what you're thinking, that sounds great, but how do I manage all of these resource tags? Well, the good thing is that you can add, modify, 
and even delete resource tags through Windows PowerShell, the Azure CLI, Azure Resource Manager templates, the REST API, or what we've been using throughout the lessons, the Azure portal. And you can use Azure policy to enforce tagging rules and conventions. For example, you can require that certain tags be added to new resources as they're provisioned. You can also define rules that reapply tags that have been removed. Now, tags aren't inherited, okay? meaning that you can apply tags one level and not have those tags automatically show up at a different level. This allows you to create custom tagging schemas that change depending on the level. So in other words, resource to resource group, resource group to subscription, and so on. Last but not least, let's explore the Azure Marketplace. Now, the Azure Marketplace lets you purchase Azure-based solutions and services from third-party vendors. Now, this could be a server with software that's pre-installed and configured, or managed network firewall appliances, or connectors to third-party backup services. When you purchase products through Azure Marketplace, you're paying for not only the Azure services that you're using, but also the services or even the expertise of the third-party vendor. Now, billing structures are set by the vendor, right? Azure has nothing to do with them when they're third-party. But all solutions available in Azure Marketplace are 100% certified and compliant with Azure policies and standards. Not just anybody gets in. Now, the certification policies may vary based on the service or solution type and the Azure service involved. That's Azure Marketplace. When we come back from the break, we'll start off with our next lesson.
So we spoke of governance being a benefit with the public cloud because there are features available to support you, the customer and the consumer to ensure that we're meeting your art organization standards. So whatever we're meeting, whatever regulatory requirements we have, we need some tools to help us with that. So let's take a look at some of the features and tools that are built into this lesson that are gonna help us with that. But first and foremost, let's talk about Azure Blueprints when it comes to governance and compliance. Blueprints are great. And what's nice about Blueprints is that we've talked about things like RBAC, right? That role-based access control. We've talked about role assignments. You know, we've talked about policies and creating them, right? But one of the best things that you can do is to manage your resource groups is to use templates. Now, when we create things, right? They take some time to set up, right? Our virtual machine that we created today, when we created a storage account, they can take some time to set up. Maybe, maybe we want to use them again. Maybe we want to create them the exact same way that we had the first time. Well, the good news is you can create what's called a blueprint. And yes, think of it the same way you think of blueprints in construction, because it's a template for your environment. And the way that Azure Blueprint works is it allows you to orchestrate a deployment of all of your different artifacts that you may have had inside of your own environment. And this is really great when we talk about things like DevOps, because you can use this to create demo environments or even test environments. And the way that the blueprint works is that if you make a change in that blueprint, well, it's actually going to make all those changes in the environments that were used or that were created using that blueprint. Now, a great way to think about this is, which we'll talk about in just a second, but it's with policies, okay? So let's say you have a ton of policies in place. You created these policies to make sure that you're secure or that you've met your compliance requirements. Well, when it comes to auditing or you know, tracing changes that have been made in you know, those different iterations of your environments, well, you can use Azure Blueprints for that. Because again, if you make the change in the blueprint, it's gonna make the change in everything that's used the blueprint. And that way, everything, everything is going to be guaranteed to be the same because you're using Azure Blueprint. Now, I know I said policies, right? So how do you ensure that your resources stay compliant? How can you be alerted if a resource's configuration has changed? Azure Policy. Azure Policy is a service in Azure that enables you to create, assign, and manage policies that control or audit your resources. Now, these policies enforce different rules across your resource configurations so that those configurations stay compliant with corporate standards. Now, how does Azure Policy define policies? Well, Azure Policy enables you to define both individual policies and groups of related policies. Those are called initiatives. Now, Azure Policy also evaluates your resources and highlights resources that aren't compliant with the policies that you've created. Azure Policy can also prevent non-compliant resources from being created. They can, they can be set at each level, which enables you to set policies on a specific resource, a specific resource group, specific subscription, and so on. Additionally, Azure policies are inherited. Again, they are inherited. So if you set a policy at a high level, it will automatically be applied to all of the groupings that fall within that parent. For example, if I set an Azure policy on a resource group, then every resource created within that resource group will automatically receive the same policy, regardless if they're a virtual machine or a SQL database or a storage account. An Azure policy comes with built-in policies and initiative definitions for storage, networking, compute, security center, and monitoring. Now, for example, if you define a policy that allows only a certain size for the virtual machines to be used in your environment, well, that policy is invoked when you try to create a new virtual machine or whenever you resize your existing virtual machines. Because Azure Policy also evaluates and monitors all current virtual machines in your environment, including virtual machines that were created prior to the policy's creation. And in some cases, Azure Policy can automatically mediate non-compliant resources and configurations 
to ensure the integrity of the state of the resources. So if all resources in a certain research group should be tagged with an app name tag and a value of, let's say, special orders, well, then Azure Policy will automatically apply that tag if it's missing. However, you still retain full control of your environment. If you have a specific resource that you don't want Azure Policy uh, to automatically fix or apply to, well, you can flag that resource as an exception. And this way, the policy won't automatically or even apply to that resource. Now, Azure Policy also integrates with Azure DevOps. It applies any continuous integration and delivery pipeline policies that pertain to the pre-deployment and the post-deployment phases of your applications. Okay, let's talk resource locks. Once we've applied our access, we've established control, right? We can control what a person can do, what a person knows. We can control who can do what, what level can they read it at, who can write it. We can decide who can delete it. We can decide who can update it. Whatever the case, remember, we are the ones that have allowed them to do it, right? Remember that allow model. However, sometimes it's helpful to have just a little extra backup or protection just in case someone, I don't know, accidentally makes a change or accidentally deletes, right? Now, many of you probably, I know, have accidentally deleted something that you didn't mean to. Or worse, maybe you actually deleted something you needed. It happens, right? It's happened to everyone. And when I think of myself, I know it's happened to me. Now, my wife and I share a OneDrive, okay? <clears throat> and one time, true story, um, my wife and I uh, had a daughter, okay? And my wife took <clears throat> so many pictures and so many videos and she uploaded them all to OneDrive. So one time in OneDrive, I had to store some, some files of my own. <clears throat> and when I went to store those files, unfortunately, I didn't read a message that said, would you like to delete essentially the older files to make room for these new files, right? I just went ahead and clicked, yes, go ahead, do whatever it takes, upload my data to the OneDrive. I deleted about 30 gigs of pictures. Yeah, 30 gigs of a newborn pictures. What do I wish I had? <laughs> I wish I had what's called a resource lock because that would have prevented me from deleting it. And inside of Azure, we have resource locks. They are designed to help you prevent accidental deletion or accidental modification. Now, a real cool thing with resource locks. Remember when we looked at that hierarchy in earlier lessons, right? We had our management groups, we had our subscriptions, we had our research groups, we had the resources within them. Well, you can apply a resource lock at almost every single level. And not only that, it's going to have that parent-child inheritance relationship where if I apply a lock at a resource group level, it's going to apply that lock and impact all of the resource within it. So this is just another great way to kind of have that additional backup, right? You want to just make sure no way, there's no way this can get deleted. Now, sometimes I get asked, well, Josh, how is that different from a role? Well, I'll tell you. Essentially, let's say I give someone read-write access. Okay? But I also don't want them to modify anything. Because sometimes, maybe normally you do want them to have write access, but in this case, you don't want any kind of modification. Okay? Well, that's where the resource lock comes in. Okay? You get more protection over that situation. They may have write access, but we don't want them to have any kind of delete access, right? So resource locks are a great way to protect yourself against any type of of accidental deletion. Because the worst thing that could happen is, oh no, I didn't mean to do that, right? And unless you have backups in place, there's no undo button. So resource locks are put in place to prevent that. Think about it this way. 
You can't accidentally delete something if there's no option to delete. So let's actually go into the portal, take a look at some policies and resource locks and do a demonstration on those. In this demonstration, we're going to create both a resource lock and a policy. So let's go straight into it by pulling up our resource group. So our resource group here is going to have a couple of tabs on the side. Now, as you can see, in our settings, we have both policies and locks. So first, let's create a lock. Now, as you can see right now, this resource has no locks. So let's go ahead and add one. So we're going to click add and we're going to name the lock and all we're going to call it is AZ, AZ 900 lock. Okay. Now the notes that we have here is we could put notes as far as to why we're doing it, you know, uh, the reasoning, who, but all we're going to put on the notes is lock for demo. Now, right here, this is the lock type. Now I could put it as read only or delete. So I'm going to put it as delete. So this way there is a lock and hopefully no resources get deleted because again, once this is through resources should not be able to be deleted. So we're actually going to go into the overview of AZ 900. And as you can see, we have a couple of resources. There's a virtual machine right here. So I'm going to select this virtual machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to delete it. And that lock should kick in and prevent us from deleting it. So let's go ahead and click delete. It's going to ask us if we want to delete. We're going to hit yes. We've read and understand that this virtual machine, as well as any selected associated resources listed above, will be deleted. So I'm going to go ahead and click delete. Oh, no! Fail to delete your virtual machine. I wonder why. Well, that's because we have resource locks. Again, resource locks are great. And I wish I had those locks before I deleted all those pictures. But this way, no one can delete those resources. Okay. However, if I wanted to, because I'm the administrator, right, I can go ahead back to my resource group and I can edit that lock. I can remove it. But anybody else who doesn't have that access wouldn't be able to. Therefore, they wouldn't be able to delete any resources. But now, what if someone tries to deploy something that I don't want, right? Now, I can stop them from deleting it, but I can't stop them from creating it. Or can I? That's where policies come into place. So I'm going to click on policies. And as you can see, currently, right now, I'm compliant with my policy. So I already have a policy in place right now. So if I click on assignments, you're going to see that right now I have a policy called allowed locations. So we're going to go ahead and click assign policy. I'm going to show you how to create it very, very simply. So the first thing is it's going to ask us where our scope is. Okay. So the scope is going to be on this resource group, which is called AZ 900. Another thing I can do is I can add exclusions to this policy. So if there's certain resource groups or certain resources that I don't want to have within this policy, I can do so. But for right now, we don't want that. We want everyone to follow the policy. Now, when it comes to the definition, you can click this little policy definition picker, and it's going to give you all types of policies. Now, in the previous one, show you how we created it. We typed in allowed locations. As you can see right here, it's the second one. So we're going to click on it and then hit select. So now, it's allowed locations. Now I can put a description and basically say this is to prevent resources from being created in unapproved uh, regions. There we go. So the policy enforcement currently is enabled and it's also going to tell you who it's assigned by. So that way, if for any reason you have an issue with that policy, you know who to contact to try to get that resolved. But before we go to creating that policy, we're going to click on the parameters because right now, yes, you can only create resources in these allowed locations, but right now I don't have any locations defined. So let's define some locations. Well, 
I only want resources created in, hmm, what was that? What was that cheap location? Aha, US East. Let's look for East US, okay? Let's scroll down nice and slow. Let's get to, there it is. Let's go to East US, okay? All right, we're gonna select that one and then we can go ahead and click Review and Create. Now, I've already created one, so I'm actually gonna go right back to our policies and this is gonna get discarded. Now, right here in our policies, you're going to see, again, it's there. It's assigned, allowed locations. So, if I were to go right back home, okay, and create a resource within that resource group, we're gonna try to create one that isn't in US East. We're gonna try to create one that is in Brazil Southeast. We wanna spend that money. So let's go ahead and create a virtual machine. Let's go to compute. Actually, you know what? Let's just do it straight from the top, nice and easy. Virtual machine, okay? And let's create a new one, all right? Azure Virtual Machine. And again, this time we want to select the resource group AZ900 because that's where our policy is in place. Now we're going to name our virtual machine Brazil. Okay, so that way we're just driving that point home. And again, here we go. Moment of truth. We are going to try to select Brazil Southeast as our deployment location. So there it is, Brazil South. I'm going to click on it. And oh no! Policy enforcement again. Ah, man, this administrator doesn't let me do anything I want. <laughs> Look there. The policy enforcement kicked in. Not even, I didn't even have to click review and create. I didn't have to go through validation. As soon as I even selected the region, the policy kicked in. And now, let's say I, as a user, decide, hey, what gives? I want to find out why this policy is in place. I can click on the policy. And right here, it's letting me know, this is the list of allowed locations. The only location I can deploy in is East US. So, as you saw with policies and resource locks, we really can make sure that our environment is compliant at all times. The Microsoft Service Trust Portal. Let's talk about that. The Microsoft Service Trust Portal is a portal that provides access to various content, tools, and other resources about Microsoft's data, security, privacy, and compliance practices. Now, the Service Trust Portal contains details about Microsoft's implementation of controls and processes that protect our cloud services and the customer data. Now, to access some of these resources on the Service Trust Portal, you need to be signed in as an authenticated user with your Microsoft Cloud Services account. But the idea here is that with the Service Trust Portal, we demonstrate transparency. We want to make it very clear that you are always in control of your data. And the Service Trust Portal features uh, content that is accessible essentially from anywhere. But on the main menu, you're going to have some categories. So the first one is going to be the Service Trust Portal itself, right? This provides a quick access hyperlink to return to the Service Trust Portal homepage. From there, you have trust documents that provide a wealth of security implementation and design information. You also have industries and regions, which provides industry and region-specific compliance information about Microsoft Cloud Services. Then you have the Trust Center. Now that links to what's called the Microsoft Trust Center, which has a lot of great information. You also have resources. Now that provides access to more resources, such as the Security and the Compliance Center. And then finally, you have My Library. Now, my library allows you to customize it because it lets you save or pin documents to quickly access them on your my library page. That's the service trust portal. But let's move on to our next section. Our next section here, we're going to discuss some of the different Azure tools that can help you manage your workload. Because when companies move to the cloud, sometimes there's, there's concern, right? They want to know, are we spending too much? Are we spending too little? Are we using the cloud correctly? Are we optimized? Can we improve? Are we secured? What happens if something goes wrong? What happens if something goes down? How do we plan for that? Well, in this section, 
we're going to talk about the tools that will help you answer every single one of those questions. Now, so far today, we've been using the portal. This is a web-based user interface where you can access basically every feature of Azure. And the reason why we show the Azure portal is because that's how most users experience Azure at first, okay? It's a very straightforward experience. But as your Azure usage grows and your experience grows and your knowledge grows, well, then things can change. Now, let's say you want to start looking at a more repeatable code-centric approach to managing your Azure resources. Now, some of these different tools that we have include Azure PowerShell or the command line interface, which you might hear referred to as CLI. And Azure PowerShell is one of these options that can use to run the commandlets. Now, you might see it spelled as C-M-D-L-T-S, but those are commandlets. And basically, what these commands do is they call the Azure REST API, and they ask them to perform basically any management task inside of Azure. Now, the nice thing with commandlets is that they can be executed independently, or you can combine them all together into a single script and execute them simultaneously. Now, Azure PowerShell is available for Windows, Linux, and Macs. And Azure CLI is also available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. And it's pretty much identical to PowerShell and what you can do with it. It's really just the syntax that you're using for both. So if you're proficient with either PowerShell or CLI, you use whatever makes you happy, right? But if you're just getting started up, okay? If this is your first dip into this area, we recommend starting with a command line interface, a CLI because the syntax is just a little bit easier to understand. Now, if you've ever used Bash in the past, it's very similar to that. So we find that students usually have an easier time grasping it that way. But remember, 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 there is no rush, especially in this fundamentals course, okay? Don't go off and start coding because you won't have to do that for the exam. But it's good to know. More importantly, know that you have that option that repeatable action, whether it's through command line interface or PowerShell, which can both run on your local machine. But you also have the option to run those commandlets. You can run them in a web browser, and that is what we call Cloud Shell. Cloud Shell is what allows you to run those commandlets, but you can do it through a web browser. Let's look at our next topic, which is the Azure Resource Manager. Now, as an Azure customer, you're going to see that you can access and manage Azure resources through various ways. You can do it through the Azure portal. You can do it through the REST API. You can create scripts and applications that automate resource deployments. You can use PowerShell. You can use CLI, you know, tons of different ways. But what I want you to know is that all of these interfaces every single one of them connect to the same point that sends the same JSON template to a service called the Azure Resource Manager. The Azure Resource Manager, or the ARM, or the ARM for short, is a centralized service and management layer that enables you to create, update, and delete resources in your Azure account. Now, regardless of the platform or interface you use, once information reaches the ARM, it reaches it in a unified template with a unified language. The JavaScript object notation, or the JSON template, that's what's being used. And it does that so that everything is consistent regardless of the interface that was initially used. And for the ARM to complete these requests of, you know, creating, updating, or deleting resources, well, the ARM communicates with the directory that's, you know, like your Azure Active Directory to ensure that you are who you say you are and that you have that level of access to do so. Remember when we created any one of our resources, we had to pass that validation. Now for the exam, know that the ARM provides a management layer that enables you to create, update, and delete resources in your subscription. It's also what handles the creation, configuration, management, 
and deletion of your resources and resource groups. And it does so, again, through the use of JSON files. Think of the ARM as that management layer that's handling those resources behind the scene. And no matter what user interface you're using with Azure, regardless if it's the portal, you know, CLI, clouds, what's behind the scenes, the one running the show, that is the Azure Resource Manager. Now with the move to the cloud, right, many teams have adopted agile development methods, right? They, they need to iterate quickly. They need to repeatedly deploy their solutions to the cloud, and they need to know that their infrastructure is in a reliable state. Now, as infrastructure has become part of the iterative process, the division between operations and development has essentially disappeared because teams need to manage infrastructure and application code through a unified process. Now, to meet these challenges, you can automate deployments and use the practice of infrastructure as code. And in code, you define the infrastructure that needs to be deployed. The infrastructure code becomes part of your project. And just like application code, you store the infrastructure code in a source repository and you version it. Now, anyone on your team can run the code and anyone can deploy it in similar environments. But to implement infrastructure as code for your Azure solutions, then you need to use something called Azure Resource Manager Templates, also known as ARM templates. Now, the template is a JSON file, okay, a JavaScript object notation file, and it defines the infrastructure and the configuration for your project. Now, this template uses declarative syntax, so that lets you state what you intend to deploy without having to write all those sequence of programming commands to create it. But in the template, you get to specify the resources to deploy and the properties for those resources. Now, if we zoom out a little bit further, we get to see Azure Arc. Now today, companies struggle to control and govern increasingly complex environments that extend across data centers, across multiple clouds, across edge. And each environment in cloud possesses its own set of management tools. And new DevOps and IT ops operational models can be hard to implement across all of these resources. That's why Azure Arc exists. Because Azure Arc simplifies governance and management by delivering a consistent multi-cloud and on-premises management platform. Azure Arc provides a centralized, unified way to do many things. It can help you manage your entire environment together by projecting your existing non-Azure and or on-premises resources into Azure Resource Manager. It can help you manage virtual machines, Kubernetes clusters, and databases as if they were running in Azure. You can even use familiar Azure services and management capabilities, regardless of where they live. You can continue using traditional IT ops while introducing DevOps practices to support your new cloud-native patterns in your environment. You can configure custom locations as an abstraction layer on top of Azure Arc-enabled Kubernetes clusters and cluster extensions. But the most important thing to remember about Azure Arc, if you hear multi-cloud, if you hear managing multi-cloud, Azure Arc is your guy. Now we're going to move on to our next section. And in this section, we'll be going over the various Azure monitoring services and how they can help our environment. So let's begin with Azure Advisor. Now, one of my favorite things about Azure is that you have the support and knowledge of the cloud team here at Microsoft. While, you know, I may not be sitting right next to you, or, you know, one of our experts aren't sitting right next to you, you're still going to have access and help. The best of it comes through a tool called Azure Advisor. Azure Advisor is a tool that's evaluating all, all of your Azure resources for free. Yes, for free. And it's providing recommendations and best practices based on five different categories. So category number one, it's evaluating your environment on reliability. Now that's used to ensure that your business critical applications are never down, that they're always up, available, and running. Number two, it's focused on security, 
It's making sure that you're able to detect threats and vulnerabilities, which could lead to pretty costly breaches. Number three, it's performance, right? Here we're looking at the speed of our applications and making sure that they're going as fast as they should be going. Then we look at cost. Now here, we want to make sure that you're optimized. And honestly, we're trying to save you money. We're looking at potentially reducing your overall Azure spending. And then finally, last, we have operational excellence. Now here, we want to help you look at workflow or process efficiency, which in turn can help you manage your resources and look at other best practices and implement them into your environment. Now we do have one other monitoring tool, and that's Azure Service Health. Okay, now you do have Azure Advisor and you have Azure Monitor, which we're gonna look at in a second. Those are specifically looking at your environments. But Azure Service Health, Azure Service Health is basically giving you a personalized view of any Azure service, not just the ones that are currently in your subscription. So if we look at Azure Service Health, right? These are type of events that might impact your services like outages or planned maintenance. Because just like in your on-premises environment, maintenance is going to be needed. And this is what's gonna help you keep everything running smoothly. Now for the most part, most of these events are gonna occur without any impact to you. And you're not gonna see them in Azure Service Health. But in the rare case, right? Let's say there's a reboot that might be required. Well, Azure Service Health can actually help you choose when to perform the maintenance to help minimize any of that downtime. And in addition to communication about outages, there's other health advisories that you might need to take action on in order to avoid interruption to your services. I don't want you to worry because I don't want you to think, oh, this happens all the time. No, it doesn't, okay? But these are sent out so well in advance that you can plan ahead. The idea here is that if anything happens to a service or anything is going to happen to a service, that you're prepared. You're making sure that your services are always up and running. Now let's look at Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor is taking all of the telemetric data that's being collected from the Azure environment and allowing you to take action on it. So there's all sorts of different places where you're collecting data from within Azure. I mean, so many places. You could be collecting it from your applications, your operating system, your resources. And essentially, what Azure Monitor is doing, it's collecting data at every management layer. Then what it's doing, it's going to keep track of all those metrics. And this is where every administrator's favorite thing lives. This is where your logs are. And you're gonna have logs and metrics for each and every source that you're collecting data from. From there, you can build out different visualizations, whether you wanna use Power BI or get real-time insights across your Azure environment. And this, this is so important because it allows you to react to critical environment alerts, right, in real time. And you can even set up an alert to be set through your phone, so that way you get it through text, or you can get it through email, or you can get it a couple different ways. The key difference between Azure Advisor and Azure Monitor is that Azure Advisor is giving you recommendations. Remember that. Azure Advisor gives you those recommendations. Now, those recommendations are coming from that telemetry data. But Azure Monitor, remember the word monitor, it's collecting information and it's giving you insight. That insight is then given to Azure Advisor to offer recommendations. So you never know. Maybe I'll see you back here for another course. No, Have a great day.
Thank <laughs> you. 